Welcome to Urban Dharma, the podcast, where suffering is optional. Hi, this is Ram Krista coming to you from downtown Los Angeles, from the International Buddhist Meditation Center in the heart of Koreatown. It's a cool and overcast day this day after Christmas 2006, and what you're about to hear is an extension class I did at Loyola Marymount University. The title of the class was Integrating Buddhist Practices into Everyday Life. This is Class 2, Part 2. The class ran from September 28th to October 19th, 2006. So, Part 2 of Class 2, Integrating Buddhist Practices into Everyday Life. Okay, so what we're going to practice is loving-kindness meditation. And, and you can actually add and subtract. It's, you don't, this, this, this is not in stone. In fact, this is something I came up with, and I changed a few words, because I didn't like some of the words. One of the words I didn't like was success. May you be successful. I didn't like that word, because success for me is on the outside. And the word I chose instead was fulfillment. And I think fulfillment's on the inside. So I don't really want everybody to be successful, but I do want everybody to be fulfilled. And the idea of success is arbitrary anyway. Um, I also started to add, um, may my parents, may my brothers and sisters, friends and relatives, I added partners. May my parents and, par- and may parents, may my parents, partners, brothers and sisters, friends and relatives, people I don't know and people I don't like. May they too be happy, peaceful, and free from suffering. So, you can add, I mean, you know, Ramdas has a great story about Caspar Weinberger, who was uh, uh, Secretary of Defense, if I'm not mistaken. And and he hated Caspar Weinberger. And he realized he wasn't going to be able to do his spiritual practice with that much hate. So he got a little picture of Caspar Weinberger and put it on his altar. So every day he'd say, he'd say a little prayer for God, and he said a little prayer for Casper. <laughs> and he tried to love him. Who was that? I'm sorry. I think he was the defense minister. But I mean, who? That was Ramdas. You know who Ramdas oh, Ram is? Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, okay. Sorry, Does everybody know who Ramdas is? Okay, let me explain. Ramdas, uh, birth name was Richard Alpert. Uh, he and Timothy Leary did LSD research at uh, Harvard University. Was it Harvard? I think it was. They were later fired because of their LSD research. Um, Timothy Leary went on the run and, and got involved with uh, uh, some interesting people, and uh, G. Gordon Liddy arrested him, and it was uh, all sorts of stuff. They ended up doing a, a, a tour, giving presentations, both of them together in the same stage, G. Gordon Liddy and Timothy Leary. Ramdas, on the other hand, went to India and found a guru and became a, sort of a yogi, you might say, and a, and a wonderful teacher and a wonderful storyteller. Ram Dass has the best stories. If you get a chance to listen to any of his old tapes or CDs, and you can find some on audible.com, by the way. I don't get money for it, but it's worth downloading and putting in your iTunes for those days when you need to hear some wise words. A couple years ago, he had a stroke, and so that pretty much limited his teaching now. But but the old stuff's still available, and um, he's just got such a great sense of humor. And so I, I I refer to him a lot. And one of the stories he tells is about Casper Weinberger, and uh, and I sort of like that because I, you know, I I'm getting to the point where I need to put Rumsfeld on my altar. And just, you know, I love you, I love you. I accept you just the way you are. This loving-kindness meditation will allow us to come to a place of acceptance with all the people we love, like, and don't like. But I also added all the people I don't know. Now, how many people don't you know? Most of them. And so we want to love them, too. We want to be kind to them as well. So, uh, let me go through the loving-kindness meditation the way I do it now. You can use this as a reference, create your own, or just use this, or use what I use. Um, My uh, technique is I say this before I start meditating, and then I say it after I finish meditating. 
I, it's really uploading some important information. And you can't say it enough. And it's important if you start a practice to say it every day. It will change the way you relate to people around you. Now, you may not change the person you hate, but you'll change the hate for the person. And now you'll come in contact with that person that you really dislike, and they'll sense there's something different about you. They may respond to you in a more positive way because you're every day saying, I love you, I love you. <coughs> and now you're in their presence and your love is showing. Your kindness is showing. Whereas before you hated this person and that shows as well. They'll be suspicious. They might think you're after something, you know. But, <laughs> but that's their stuff, right? Our job is just to love them, and they can do with that love whatever they like. Now, when you start to love people, and you start to accept them the way they are, does that mean you just do anything they want you to do? And I would say, absolutely not. There was a high school student who asked me that question. Well, if I try to love everybody, and somebody wants me to you know, do something terrible because I love them, sh should I do it because I love them? Because I want to accept them? I said, no, no, no. But when you say no... Do it in a kind way. So if you love somebody, you're always kind to them, whether you do what they want you to do or whether you don't do what they want you to do. You're always kind to them. And can you say no in a kind way? Only if you love them. Because if you hate them and you're going to say no, it's going to come through as anger. Very interesting. Yeah. But we don't lose our boundaries. We don't lose our boundaries. We need to stay on course and we need to have the idea in our mind what is skillful, what is unskillful, what creates suffering, suffering, what reduces suffering. So if, if you can, just sort of put your feet on the ground and sort of your back straight. These chairs are pretty good for back straight. And, and just you can close your eyes or keep them open and, and listen to the words I'm going to say. And let me get my bell. That's a nice touch. And, and I'll say it a couple times. I'll, I'll just go through this a couple times so you get the, sort of the pace, the cadence. But again, you need to make it your own. And it really helps, if you're alone when you're meditating, to say this out loud. So you can hear yourself saying it. It really makes a bigger difference. And I'm going to just say it the way I normally say it, so it may be a little different than what's written down. May those of us who have come together tonight, in mind and heart, be happy, peaceful, and free from suffering. May no harm come to us. May no difficulties come to us. May no problems come to us. May we always find fulfillment. May we also have patience, courage, understanding, and determination to meet and overcome the inevitable difficulties, problems, and failures in life. May our teachers and all teachers of the truth be happy, peaceful, and free from suffering. May no harm come to them. May no difficulties come to them. May no problems come to them. May they always find fulfillment. May they also have patience courage, understanding, and determination to meet and overcome the inevitable difficulties, problems, and failures in life. <coughs> May our parents, our partners, our brothers and sisters, our friends and relatives, all the people we don't know, all the people we don't like, may they too be happy, peaceful, and free from suffering. May no harm come to them. 
May no difficulties come to them. May no problems come to them. May they always find fulfillment. May they also have patience, courage, understanding, and determination to meet and overcome the inevitable difficulties, problems, and failures in life. From the highest realm of existence to the lowest, may all beings arisen in any of these realms, with form and without, with perception and without, with consciousness and without, may they too be happy, peaceful, and free from suffering. May no harm come to them. May no difficulties come to them. May no problems come to them. May they always find fulfillment. May they also have patience, courage, understanding, and determination to meet and overcome the inevitable difficulties, problems, and failures in life. May those of us who have come together tonight in mind and heart be happy, peaceful, and free from suffering. May no harm come to us. May no difficulties come to us. May no problems come to us. May we always find fulfillment. May we also have patience, courage, understanding, and determination to meet and overcome the inevitable difficulties, problems, and failures in life. May our teachers and all teachers of the truth be happy, peaceful, and free from suffering. May no harm come to them. May no difficulties come to them. May no problems come to them. May they always find fulfillment. May they also have patience, courage, understanding, and determination to meet and overcome the inevitable difficulties, problems, and failures in life. May our parents, our partners, our brothers and sisters, our friends, and our relatives, all the people we don't know, all the people we don't like, may they too be happy, peaceful, and free from suffering. May no harm come to them. May no difficulties come to them. May no problems come to them. May they always find fulfillment. May they also have patience, courage, understanding, and determination to meet and overcome the inevitable difficulties, problems, and failures in life. From the highest realm of existence to the lowest, may all beings arisen in any of these realms, with form and without, with perception and without, with consciousness and without. May they be happy, peaceful, and free from suffering. May no harm come to them. May no difficulties come to them. May no problems come to them. May they always find fulfillment. May they also have patience, courage, understanding, and determination to meet and overcome the inevitable difficulties, problems, and failures in life. May the suffering ones be suffering free, the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief, and the sick find health, relief.
okay. Now what we were doing is we were uploading information. We were just, uh, it's important if you can and have the time to memorize this. And you can take it with you anywhere you go then. Can you imagine sitting in the airport, which I'll be doing at the end of this month, with nothing to do? And then just saying, well, I'm going to do loving kindness meditation. And you just start doing this. And you close your eyes. And you go into that very peaceful place. And then somebody disturbs you and asks you a question. And you look up and you're so kind and loving. Oh, it's, it's right over there. You can't miss it. And then, ah. <laughs> what a wonderful gift that would be to bring to the airport, you know? <laughs> Kindness. So this is something I've been doing for years, and it just really does make a difference. Does, does anybody feel differently after listening to this? Your voice changed. Yeah. I thought that was very interesting. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it does change. Yeah. Yeah. Yours might too. Yeah. Did you know what she means a bell? <coughs> Did, what's that? Do you, the bell. Do, yes. Uh, actually, if you're alone, you don't need the bell. Uh, the bell is for groups. And, um, and what you would do is you'd ring it three times, and that would be the beginning. And then you just, each paragraph for each little thought, and you'd separate it. And then the end would be three times. And that way you're letting the group know when it begins and when it ends. But if you're just doing it all by yourself, you already know that. So it's fine. Now, one of the problems that people have when they start to meditate, and we're going to talk about it in that great depth next week, silent meditation, concentration meditation, is how do you know when your 15 minutes is up? You know? And I know if I'm leading the meditation, I've got a big clock right in front of me on the floor. So every so often my eyes have to open and I have to check the time because I don't want... I mean, if I forget and get into my meditation practice, I might go over time and then people will be very angry with me. Because they don't want to go overtime. They just want to do the time that's uh, allotted. So w- what I did in, in the beginning was I went to Radio Shack and bought a timer. And I, I, and I made sure the alarm wasn't very loud because I didn't want to get a heart attack when the thing went off. But they have some really nice alarms that are, are relatively soft and gentle. And you simply set the timer for like 15, 20 minutes. Some wristwatches have that same function, too. You can be a timer or a stopwatch. And, and then you just simply close your eyes and go into your object of meditation. And then when the timer goes off, you wake up. Or you not wake up, but you stop meditating. It, there comes a point in your meditation practice where you're sitting down and you say, I'm going to sit for 15 minutes. And you actually sit for 15 minutes without the aid of a clock or a timer. Your internal stuff has been conditioned now, and it's fascinating. Uh, I guess it's one of the first psychic powers you get. You know when 15 minutes is up. I don't know how useful that would be in the real world, but it makes you feel good. So there are sort of this, we have to set our mind uh, at peace, and ritual seems to do that. And if we have a consistency in our practice and sit in the same place each week, if you have a corner of your apartment or your house, and, and assign that as your meditation place. And the, don't med- any t- meditate any other place than that. What you start to do is create an energy in that space. Now, the Zendo where I meditate, people have been meditating there since 1970. And the stuff is in the walls. You can actually feel it. People have left their samadhi behind. Samadhi is that sort of like calm, relaxed, clear state of mind that occurs in meditation. And so people do leave energy behind. And you can do that in your own house or apartment. Pick a spot and always sit in the same spot. And try to pick a time and discipline yourself to sit at the same time. Now, if you normally get up at like 7 in the morning because you work and school obligations, maybe you could get up at 6.30 and have that first half hour as your time. 
in, in the beginning, it's quite a challenge because uh, for me, I would think, well, I, gosh, I could be sleeping this extra half hour. And wouldn't sleep be more important than getting up and sitting quietly? <laughs> well, as it turns out, <coughs> getting up and sitting quietly turns out to be more important than sleep. And, and you can get just as rested in those 20 minutes of meditation as you would getting that last half hour of sleep in the morning. So it's better to do it in the morning than later in the day? It's actually better to do it in the morning and the evening before you go to sleep. I thought of it as being bookends on my day. I'd get up in the morning, I'd have that, those 15, 20 minutes, and that would sort of set me up for the rest of the day. And then after the day didn't go the way it was supposed to go, those, those 15, 20 minutes before I went to sleep allowed me to have good dreams. Very cool. Now, this is something that happened to me, and it might happen to you too if you, if you take up this practice, that you assign a certain amount of time for your practice, and then the rest of the time is your life. So say you do a half hour in the morning and a half hour in the evening. So now you have one hour of practice and 23 hours of life. And that goes along for a while, and then you get sort of good at meditating and practicing, and you decide to do your first retreat, maybe a weekend retreat, a Friday, Saturday, and Sunday afternoon. And you go, and now you'll be practicing all the time for a whole weekend. What I found in my own practice in life that I started to have more practice than life. That it the the line of demarcation started to blur and and eventually I had no life at all. I only had practice. Now that sounds sort of depressing and disappointing, but it really isn't. It means that when you leave the house, you're practicing. And when you get to work, you're practicing. And when you're going on the freeway, you're practicing. That becomes your practice. And eventually, that practice actually turns into performance. And you no longer have to practice. It simply works through you. So in my current line of work, most of my stuff is practice. Most of the stuff I do every day is my practice. And you can look at it as your meditation. Just sort of what you do. So people are disappointed when they find out I don't have a life. You don't have a life, Kusla? No, I don't have a life. I just have a practice. But I always have something to do. That's what's cool about having a practice. You always have something to do, whether it's going right or going wrong. Yes? <coughs> Yes, there's a very big difference between concentration and mindfulness. Um, mindfulness requires momentary concentration. And, and the concentration techniques we'll be talking about next week require you to have sustained concentration, going deeper and deeper into one-pointedness. When you're going through the day and you don't have a life? Yes, when I'm going through the day and don't have a life, uh, I'm m more mindful than concentrated. And, and so, and, and it's simply, uh, literally, mind being full of what you're doing right now. And those are such wonderful moments. When I work on my motorcycle and change the oil, you know, I just sort of like change the oil. And it could be 20, 30 minutes, and I'm tightening this and adjusting that. And, oh, it's a great, great feeling, because uh, you're so connected to the process. You're not detached from it, and you're not fixing your motorcycle. You and the motorcycle sort of like together, become one. When you're sitting doing your meditation in the morning, you can choose either mindfulness or concentration meditation. Yes. And then are you, do you choose also to either open your eyes or close your eyes or focus on something? Yes. Well, I'm going to go into detail next week, but uh, uh, actually, uh, I find it better to close my eyes. Unless you're reading that. Uh, unless you're learning that, but once you get it memorized, then you can close your eyes. The problem with keeping your eyes open is you get distracted. And if you're sitting with a large group of people, there's always somebody moving and adjusting and scratching, and, and then you still, you know. Uh, so. Mindfulness is a, a bit different. And, uh, I'm yeah, I'm getting confused with this mindfulness and 
Okay, there's there's two kinds of meditation. There's uh, concentration. Forty, four, zero different kinds of things you can concentrate on. Okay. Mindfulness, four things. Mindfulness of the mind, mindfulness of mental objects, mindfulness of sensations, mindfulness of the body. And um, so the, the techniques are radically different, but we'll go into that. And... Uh, Mo- I, I did mindfulness for a while, but I, with me in my personality, I kept getting agitated. And because I have a certain amount of clarity anyway, and it just added to my clarity, and I really saw how screwed up the world was, and I wasn't very happy. And so I went back to concentration and got some of that bliss and rapture going, and was able to, you know, come to a place of acceptance with this world. So some people are too laid back. Have don't have much clarity at all and need a good dose of mindfulness. Some people have too much clarity and need to have a buffer, need to have sort of a uh, a little wall around them so that the information comes in and sort of gets caught in that and then it comes through in a slower pace and you're able to assimilate it and make sense of it. And that was me. And so I, I to this day continue to do concentration and don't do mindfulness because it allows me to. Um, still have enough clarity, but have acceptance. And that's what I need more. And you can be saying the same meditation in both minds. Yes. The words you're saying. And the words, yes, this is, this is something else. Exactly. Complete, this is something else. Yes. And actually, both mindfulness and concentration start at the same place. But there comes a fork in the road where you have to decide. Mindfulness, concentration, mindfulness, concentration. What is transcendental, transcendental meditation, like, like TM? Um, it's, uh, generally speaking, mantra recitation. They, they sell you a mantra, and then that's your own personal mantra that you use, and you go into great states of bliss and rapture and concentration. What mantras do is they cut your discursive thoughts into many pieces. You really never get a chance to cluster all those thoughts into big daydreams because the mantra is like a sharp knife. It just keeps cutting Coca-Cola, 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 Coca-Cola. And all those thoughts just sort of fall into pieces. So mantra, mantra meditation works well for people that have a lot of discursive thought. It stops the train, derails the train, doesn't give it a chance to cluster. Good thing. I suppose you transcend your small self and find the big self. But you can do that without yes, you can. You can do that without meditation, too. Mm-hmm. A walk in the Santa Monica Mountains can oftentimes mm-hmm. transcend you. Yeah, it's good. Well, it's drawing time, but you know what I want to do? I, wa- I wanted to share one of my meditation techniques with you, uh, and it's uh, playing the harmonica. You know, one of the things I found about the harmonica, it really is like a meditation. And, uh, and it took me years of practice to have it turn into any kind of performance. But I realized if I, if I play it well, it plays itself. And the breathing technique that I realized in my harmonica playing, I also transplanted into my meditation practice for a couple of years. And that's diaphragmic breathing, which allows you to really get into some bliss and rapture states. Uh, not useful, though. I mean, that's, you know, those things are so easy to get attached to. So um, I usually bring this to the high schools because the, 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 the kids like uh, the blues. And um, I was thinking just the other day, I mean, what other kind of music would a Buddhist play than the blues, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so it works out. I do. Yeah, I do. So here we go. This is a little spontaneous blues.
Okay. There we go. Doesn't that make you feel good to hear that? Yeah, that. So if you're inclined to want to go into breath meditation, maybe buying a $5 harmonica and practicing that will allow you to meditate even better. I'm not advocating that, but but that's what I sort of did, and that really helped my meditation practice. But I, I imagine any wind instrument would do the same thing, you know. Very portable, you know, and people are sort of amazed at how many different sounds it can make. Is that yeah. Huh? Is that like a standard size harmonica? This is a standard size diatonic harmonica. It is small, yeah. Yeah. They're, they have the chromatic harmonicas, which are big, and play all the notes, but this only plays in one key. This plays in the key of C. Unless, unless you play blues style, which I was doing, and that plays in the key of F then, on a C harmonica. It's called cross harp. So it's a technique that the old blues guys figured out, and, uh, and it turned into a whole musical form. And the first time I heard it was back in the 80s. I heard it live, heard it live, never heard the blues live before. And this guy got on the stage with his blues harmonica and just played, and I went, I got to learn how to do that. I had never heard anybody make those kind of sounds before. And so I went to McCabe's Guitar Shop in Santa Monica, and they had a whole section of harmonica instruction manuals and tapes and stuff. And the one I picked was Blues Harmonica for the Musical Idiot. <laughs> and I'm going, okay, I can work with this, you know. It was, it was done by a man named David Harp, not his real name. And I just got this cassette, and I just listened to it a thousand times. And I would take this thing everywhere I went, to work, to the beach, drove people nuts. But one day, it turned from practice into performance. One day, it just sort of played itself. And I'm going, that is so cool, you know? So it's, uh, so music taught me a lot about how life works, you know, and the practice of music. And people say, well, you must have some talent, Kusla. I said, not an ounce of talent, but I do have time to practice. <laughs> and, and meditation is actually the same thing. Some people have some talent when it comes to meditation, but most people just practice. And that's enough. And it still works. So, well, thank you all for making the trek out again on this Thursday evening. And as we get uh, into next week, we're going to get more and more into meditation and sort of different states of mind that arise. And, and uh, so it's a lot of fun. And plus, we'll practice, too. So you can take it home with you. And... And I, I should bring maybe a meditation cushion to show you the differences because they have kapok and they have barley corn husks and each one has a different consistency and, and support value. And there's something called a zabutan, which is like the futon for your knees. And, and these are available online or at some of the meditation or Buddhist bookstores like Bodhi Tree and really help your meditation practice to have the right cushion. And it's really good to sit on the floor if you can. If you can't, a chair is fine. You do it on like just a good Pilates mat or yoga mat, or these are different though, aren't they? Yeah, those are different. You could do that. When I was a volunteer at State Prison, what we did is we got wool blankets and rolled them up, and that's what the prisoners sat on. So yeah, you can use pretty much anything that works. Uh, but they actually have, you know, stuff and colors and diagrams, and you can really go all the way. And then you can get matching clothes too if you want. <laughs> Really look good, you know. <laughs> yeah, well, if you're by yourself, you're just looking good, you know. <laughs> so, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. okay, that's it. That was class two, part two of an extension class I taught at Loyola Marymount University titled Integrating Buddhist Practices into Everyday Life. Hope you found it interesting. Hope you found it useful. If you'd like to listen to more podcasts and interviews I've done with a variety of folks, please visit dharmatalks.info. That's dharmatalks.info. If you'd like to download some free e-books and a 2007 Buddhist calendar, please visit buddhabooks.info. That's buddhabooks.info. If you'd like to email me, my email address is kusala at urbandharma.org. That's kusala at urbandharma.org.
org. Coming up in January, January 11th to February 8th, 2007, I'll be teaching another extension class at Loyola Marymount University on Thursdays from 7.30 until 9.30. The title of the class will be The Buddhist Eightfold Path, A Way to Happiness. If you live in the LA area and might be interested in taking the class, please visit urbandharma.org and scroll to the bottom of the page for more information. Well, that's it. That's the end of this podcast. I'll be posting the next one soon. Uh, so until the next one, be happy, be peaceful, and most of all, be free from suffering. <laughs>